The second thing I wanted to comment on centers just on our evolutionary origin and this idea you expressed a few minutes ago that just like ants are obliged to make their colonies, we're obliged to make our social networks. And this leads to one bit of context I'd like to settle before we continue. So I'm sure everyone listening is familiar with the idea that our genes play a major role in determining our phenotype. So our observable characteristics, the other large player being our environment, but they may be less familiar with the extended phenotype, which I, I think you mentioned that in the book that it's a term introduced by Richard Dawkins, but which roughly refers to the idea that our genes also determine the way we interact with and alter our environment. So I'm wondering if you could flesh this idea out a bit more. So there, I mean, there are some great examples in your book, uh, spider webs come to mind, but it's important for the understanding of how our genes, how genes carried by an individual affect societies. So, um, so the intellectual history here is very interesting to me. I don't know if it'll be interesting to you or your listeners. Uh, I think so it will be around around two thousand and. Um, I don't know, 2005, 2007, somewhere in there. Actually, it was before the uh, the 2008 election, presidential election. Uh, my a, co a colleague of mine, James Fowler, and I had been doing a lot of work on social networks. And we had just done a study, a, a, a twin study, uh, looking at a sort of a behavior genetic study, looking at the idea that our genes might cause us to shape our social networks and, and 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 in its most limited sense that's a very simple claim like for example every listener is probably familiar with the idea that some children are born shy and some children are born gregarious people vary in their taste for friendship for example this is not a a radical claim nor particularly innovative but we had done some work in behavior genetics showing for example that if you had tom dick and harry in a room whether uh Tom was friends with Dick depended not just on Tom's genes or on, on, on Dick's genes, but on, on Harry's genes. You know, whether you and your neighbor are friends with each other depends on my genes. H how can this be? Well, we had some evidence to suggest that, it, that your friendship, you, you and your friend, might depend on my proclivity to introduce you two to each other. That people, for example, might knit the social network around them together, brokering introductions, for example, among other people. Therefore, my genes play a role in the structure of the social network outside my body, just like, for example, a bird might be have a propensity to knit twigs together to make a nest with particular characteristics. So we were doing this kind of research, and it's a, it's a body of work that I continue to do to the present day, looking at the with other collaborators, but and looking at the at the kind of evolutionary biology and physiology of friendship, um, you know, what are the genetic antecedents and physiologic antecedents to and physiologic consequences of and over the long arc of our evolution, the genetic consequences of of friendship. So I we've done this paper, and uh, I was uh, uh, actually in uh, at the University of Virginia giving a talk. Uh, just before the presidential election, and uh, all of a sudden, I was just struck by by how much bigger this idea was than I had realized. That that our bodies, the, the the impact of our genes, didn't just shape the structure and function of our bodies, didn't just shape the structure and function of our minds, but also could shape the structure and function of our of our of our social worlds. Of course, E.O. Wilson had been work done a ton of work on. On 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 um, on um, on this on related topics, but there was a very specific meaning to this topic that 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 our genes could shape something outside our body. And at the time, I had done some reading about how some classic papers about in psychiatry and in in, in uh, behavior genetics, whereby psychiatrists had become interested in what they call endophenotypes. So, for example a propensity to anxiety that might be inside your body and is not manifest. So I thought, well, really what we're thinking about here is what I would call exophenotypes. And, and I was 
really captivated with this idea. I thought this was just a fantastic idea. You know, like how how did I stumble on this incredible you know idea? And then very soon thereafter, I read a book by Richard Dawkins <laughs> called The Extended Phenotype, wherein he had basically had this idea like 20 years earlier, which was really dispiriting. You know? <laughs> like, I was like, you know, it's like, it was such a good idea. And of course, he had had it, you know, much earlier. This happens all the time, by the way, in the history of ideas and in science. And uh, it was a really a, both a reassuring but hard lesson for me. But anyway, there were certain ways in which in our hands, the notion of an ex exophenotype was slightly different than what Richard had been arguing. And also, it, in our case, Richard, the, this magnificent book, The Extended Phenotype, um, is a theoretical exercise, and there was no empirical evidence in the book. Whereas we had, and other labs around the world, by the way, had begun to accrue evidence of the um, fundamentally genetic nature of the extended phenotype. So, so that's the origin of, of the, you know, sort of a chance, a twin study of sociality, a uh, chance reading of a papers about endophenotypes, a kind of metaphoric leap because of my familiarity with the Greek language. Well, if they're endophenotypes, maybe they're exophenotypes. Uh, and then, um, and the kind of, you know, expansion in my mind about like what could be going on there. Then the discovery of, of course, of Dawkins incredibly important much early, much earlier work and uh, and so on. But we then spent a lot of time actually hunting down this idea and finding examples. and and many other labs are doing the same thing. and the and the classic examples are ones you mentioned. For example, a spider, you know if if natural selection shaped the mouth parts in the front of the spider to get bigger, to catch more animals, we would very trivially accept that as uh, the workings of, genetics and natural selection. But the spider on the other end of its body with its spinnerets can create what is basically a big mouth with the net that it makes, but it creates it outside its body and leaves it behind. And of course, birds make nests and, um, and beavers make dams. A beaver has to make a dam just as like a beaver has a big flat tail that it, it slaps it, it has to make dams, and it makes dams of a characteristic type, a characteristic height, with characteristic materials in a characteristic manner. And uh, beavers will do this innately. There's another whole topic about bird song, for example, and whether some learned bird songs or... are innate and some are learned and so on. But the beavers make the dams innately. But the amazing thing is, and then I'll shut up, the amazing thing is that the beaver makes a dam, it modifies the environment, okay? And when it makes a dam, it, it changes the shoreline. So instead of having like a little creek, now you have a pond with a large perimeter. And this, this modification of the environment that the beaver makes acts as a selection pressure on other animals, right? Different kinds of fish and plants can now thrive in this different uh, watery environment than they could before. Uh, as much as if the beaver were predating these other animals, right? Like if we understand that predators modify change, you know, our selection pressure on prey. So here the beaver now is, is modifying the environment. And it's almost acting like a predatory force on the plants and animals around it. And, and that's pretty simple to understand, although it's a little step from the beaver predate, actually predating these animals. But see, here's the thing. The beaver not only modifies the evolutionary trajectory of other species, it modifies the evolutionary trajectory of its own. The beaver creates a dam outside its body, which is now a feature of the environment. And that creates a selection pressure on the beaver. So beavers, let's say, with bigger lungs that can forage a bigger perimeter, thrive more than beavers with smaller lungs now that a dam has been built. And then beavers with bigger lungs can, in the next generation, want to make, let's say, bigger dams. So you get this feedback loop where the animal is programmed to make something outside its body. That feature now circles back and modifies the evolutionary trajectory of the animal. And you can have a kind of breakneck uh, movement down this evolutionary path. And the argument that, that I make in Blueprint is, in essence, that, that we humans knit the people around us or modify the social networks around us 
and therefore particular kinds of humans can thrive. You know, friendly people make friendly networks, and friendly networks are especially conducive to friendly people. Now, there are wrinkles and complications to the story, but that's the gist of it. 